Hello and welcome everyone to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Network uh, webinar series. Uh, today we're focusing on spatial genomics. I will start with a couple announcements. Uh, first of all, a reminder to please join the HCA if you're not already a member. Um, you can follow the link to our webpage and uh, select to be a member of any of the 18 uh, HCA bio biological networks. This way you can participate actively in Atlas building and um, uh, we will announce uh, our future meetings and we are happy to see you there. Uh, please follow the links. Uh, if you are planning uh, a publication, please follow this link and submit your paper for inclusion as an HCA publication. This can help your paper gain more visibility. It's a short Google questionnaire, uh, takes less than a minute to complete. And uh, if you have any questions, please email us. Uh, upcoming HCA events. We are hoping to see you at the virtual town hall on June 5th. The HCA general meeting this year is in Milan, uh, September 29th, 30th. Uh, the registration will open soon. The HCA Asia meeting is in December in Hong Kong. And next year's general meeting is uh, in Singapore. Uh, for sponsorship and exhibitor opportunities that we're welcoming very much, please contact us at meetings at humansalatlas.org. Today we have fantastic speakers. We have four speakers today, uh, Sonia, Alan, Liat, and Faye. And the subsequent discussion will be moderated by Muz and Musa. Um, so for the first speaker, uh, Sonia unfortunately will have to leave right after her talk. So she will take her questions um, right after the talk, you can submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For everyone else, please submit your questions and uh, they will be addressed either in writing or during the discussion at the end. Um, so with this, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Uh, it's Sanya Vitskovic. She's a director of technology innovation and core facility at the New York Genome Center and Columbia University, as well as Wallenberg Academy Fellow at Uppsala University. Sanya pioneered novel spatial resolves trans transcriptomics and genomics methods that enable massively parallel in situ profiling of intact tissue samples. She has vast experience in spatial and single cell genomics, data analysis, and software implementations, which focus on developing accessible genomics methods for use in clinic. Sanya, welcome, and thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Owen, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, let me just share my screen. So, hi, everyone. Um, so I will today talk a little bit about um, how to measure um, things over space and time with the focus on uh, the large intestine or the colon. So uh, when we're talking about the colon, uh, we should always think about two functional axes. The first axis on the left represents the proximal to distal um, functionality of the colon. Um, and that's partly uh, also um, how the colon develops. On the right-hand side, there's also another functional axis. These are the crypts. So from the, from the top of the bottom of the crypt, um, different cells inhibit these areas and perform very different function. Um, while uh, many other groups, including us, have previously tried to address these two functional axes, we have not done this in a systematic fashion that spans the whole um, lifespan of an organ. In order to address this, we uh, decided uh, to follow the following study design. So if we wanted to address functional axes over time, of course, we have to have temporal variation. Um, so we sampled uh, the murine colon from when the mice are born at P0 to when the mice have reached very um, old age at two years. Um, also, we have focused on sampling serially the whole colon from the proximal to the distal um, end. Uh, we included 11 different time points from juvenile, adult, and aged mice, uh, three colonic regions, as I already mentioned, 
All of these were sampled uh, first by single nuclear RNA sequencing for about 400,000 uh, profiles in total after all the QCs. Um, and in our study, we used um, 65 mice. Um, so you can think of it as 11 time points, uh, three colonic region and two sexes. Um, and we sampled over 1,500 um, H&E tissue sections from these mice. Um, these tissue sections, you see it's the inserts on the um, upper right picture. Um, every single one of these H&E images was annotated for four, 14 different morphological regions of interest to facilitate tissue registration. So these uh, morphological regions are interested, usually what the histologist or, or pathologist will say, oh, these are the important functional units within a column section. Um, however, uh, we were lucky enough to, over the last uh, 10 years, develop different technologies, not only to profile isolated nuclei and profile histology uh, by themselves, we also developed a technology called spatial transcriptomics that many of you have heard of um, before. So ST, um, just to recap very briefly, enables us to connect histology, so H&E imaging, to RNA sequencing. Um, how this works is that the fresh frozen tissue sections is placed, placed on top of a spatially barcoded microarray, which you see in the upper panel. Um, this spatially barcoded microarray, um, each spot, um, contains a different DNA barcode. We exactly know where we deposited each of the DNA barcodes, making an artificial Cartesian grid. Um, after the tissue section is placed on top of this um, DNA barcoded grid, um, h &E staining is performed, imaging is performed. Um, so we are recapping that information that histology or pathology departments anyways always have. Uh, but after that, we do very gentle permeabilization of the tissue so that the mRNA flows um, on top of our spatially barcoded arrays. Um, it attaches to a poly-DT capture probe that just precedes the spatially, spatial DNA barcode. And then we do reverse transcription. After reverse transcription, it's very easy um, and all the standard library prep tools can be used to perform paired end DNA sequencing. Um, so before sequencing, remember we have the 1,500 sections worth of H&E information that has been annotated into 14 different morphological categories. But after sequencing, we can probe that data set for specific genes of interest. Um, and we don't have to define these genes of interest beforehand. So this is a genome-wide technology. Um, however, as you might have noticed, uh, many iterations of this technology have not yet been um, at single cell level. Um, we have done many technological breakthroughs since then, but uh, this particular uh, large data set was done using a commercialized technology called Visium. Um, one of the caveats with this technology is while you can generate very, very, very many sections and data sets reproducibly, each of these capture locations or capture areas, it's not a single cell resolution. So what I'm pulling up on the screen is a capture location of a uh, bottom of a um, neuron crypt. Um, so you see very many different cell types. And on the right-hand side, you see a vector of gene expression that you would get by sequencing. So over the years, us and many others have developed many Bayesian, deep learning, machine learning, and MF-based algorithms to try to deconvolve this vector of the convoluted ST data on the left with a combination or linear combination of vectors for single, from single nucleus RNA-seq data. Uh, but what happens here is that um, in a lot of occasions, when you try to deconvolve the spatial data with the single nucleus data, um, in 25 to 30% of the cases, you will not only reach one plausible, equally plausible solutions you will um, reach multiple ones and you don't know which one of those is the correct, biologically correct solution. Um, however, in our case, um, with spatial transcriptomics data, we have the rich histology information. So this means that uh, we can use this information to do semantic segmentation. Um, in semantic segmentation, we can then assign cell superclasses. So cell superclasses can be very, very broad cell classes. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, we are maybe looking at epithelial, 
fibroblast, muscle cells, and immune cells. It doesn't have to be more detailed than this, but these um, labels to the cells have to be reproducible. So what we uh, can then do is label our whole data set um, using semantic segmentation, a little bit of training. Um, in our case, we had 1,500 tissue sections um, sampled over 11 time points and three parts of the colon. As I say, each of these spots already has one um, anatomical label, for example, um, the bottom of the crypt or the top of the crypt, but now uh, only 2% of all of this data um, needs to be additionally labeled to assign a cell superclass. A random forest classifier is then trained and predict the, the rest of the um, cell superclasses in the whole data set. Um, the whole data set contains around three and a half uh, million different segmented nuclei. Um, so if you can now um, imagine this scenario that not only that do you have the vector of expression of ST data, you also now have this um, semantic segmentation information um, that you have labeled from histology. So if you were now to restrict your deconvolution task using these cell superclasses by saying, okay, this percentage of the, the capture spot contains epithelial and immune cells, then when you go through the deconvolution task of running the linear combinations of the single nucleus RNA-seq data to explain the ST data, now instead of, for example, in 65 to 70% of cases reaching one possible solution, with this additional constraint to the model, in 97% of the cases, you reach one possible um, solution to this problem. So we, of course, didn't want to stop here. We wanted to now um, take these cellular estimates per spatial spot into a um, Bayesian model we called C-splotch. So um, C-splotch um, is that kind of uh, core part of our analysis that really gives us the spatial and temporal modeling of these 1,500 tissue sections, 3.5 million cell segments, uh, over 11 different time points and three parts of the column. So C-splotch is a hierarchical full Bayesian model uh, that takes into consideration the spatial transcriptomics gene expression and the deconvolved um, single nucleus profiles from each and single spot. Uh, then through Monte Carlo sampling, um, it takes into consideration both the spatial um, and the sample models. That means that not only do we care about the spatial spot, we care about the neighbors of each and single spatial spot that we're analyzing, and we care from which region of interest that spot uh, comes from. These regions of interest are those 14 different histological labels that I introduced um, in the beginning. For example, you have the top of the crypt or the bottom of the crypt. Uh, what this enables us is to share information uh, between these uh, different tissue sections that are part of the same covariate in the data. Covariates are age, region, and sex in our case, but of course you can have genotype here as well. This means that I'm sharing information, for example, between mice that are um, 12 weeks of age, that are from the proximal colon, that are male, and that are located in the top of the crypts. And then I'm, of course, doing these uh, type of uh, Monte Carlo samplings from, for each single gene and each single spot uh, in our model. Uh, what happens is that the results, uh, what the model gives you, are posterior estimates of that uh, gene expression rates that you see, see on the right. On the x-axis, you see the betas, so the characteristic gene expression rates for different genes. Uh, but what, if you, what happens when you have Bayesian posterior estimates, it enables you to do hypothesis testing. So given that it's a full Bayesian and hierarchical model, what we can do now is ask questions. So uh, which genes are spatially differentially expressed between, for example, neurons or and any other cell type um, in the bottom of the crypts? We can ask questions, um, well, which genes are differentially expressed between the crypt apex and the crypt base, the distal and the proximal part of the colon, or the old and juvenile mice? Um, I will now try to guide you how, in practice, these results look. Let's first focus on just the adult colon. 
a, a, a little bit more simple example to start with. Um, what we did is we sampled around 40 sections from each part of the colon uh, for three male and three female mice. What we did then, first, we deconvolved the single cell profiles. Um, in the bottom, you're seeing two plots. On the left-hand side, we're seeing the fraction of cell types present um, in each um, in the cross-mucosal part of the column. Uh, Y-axis says the fraction, the X-axis says the different cell types. Uh, what we are seeing is that, well, um, some cell types don't change between the proximal, middle, and distal column. Their proportions don't change. For example, the macrophages stay the same. Um, you're detecting in, in the same amounts. But for example, goblet cells, you have many more goblet cells in the distal part, the green labeled in green versus the proximal part labeled in blue. Um, okay, this is the type of information you might be getting from your single net nuke or single cell um, data sets. Um, although here, the advantage is that you're deconvolving spatial data. So you don't necessarily um, are uh, biased by uh, tissue dissociation techniques. Uh, but on the right hand side, what happens now in the C-splotch model is that, well, I know I have more um, goblet cells in the distal than, than the proximal colon, but I want to know what these goblet cells are doing. So first you can ask question, uh, for example, which marker is not differentially expressed between um, these two or three parts of the column? So for example, we're looking then on the right hand side um, on uh, correct characteristic gene expression, so betas, on the x-axis, and uh, uh, how many times betas is sampled on the y-axis, uh, we see three uh, distributions, or these distributions represents how many the samples from the Monte Carlo. Um, we see that three, three distributions are very close to each other. The green, the blue, and the orange are very close to each other. Uh, well, that means that the means of these distributions um, are not uh, very significantly um, different from each other. So what I'm making here is a conclusion that the gene TFF3 is not differentially expressed between these different parts of the column. But TFF3 actually is a marker gene for goblet cells. So I wouldn't necessarily expect it to be very uh, different between the, the, the different parts of the column. But then the two bottom graphs show mucin 2 as SPR2B, uh, which are differentially expressed between the parts of the column. Mucin 2 is more uh, highly abundant in the distal column, um, producing more uh, mucus. Um, again, something we, we expected. And then SPRR2B uh, is very much um, responsible for antimicrobial activity and more highly expressed in the proximal column. So now we, with the C-splotch method, we can both find marker genes and we can find regional variants. Um, okay, uh, but as I said, the, the functional axis of the column is not only defined by the proximal to distal axis, it's also um, defined by its vertical crypt axis. So on the left-hand side, we are seeing, uh, again, proximal, middle, and distal uh, columns, um, and we're seeing uh, the histology of uh, apex to the crypt. Uh, then what also happens is on the right-hand side, we're seeing on top compositional gradients of the cell types and the bottom, uh, which genes are actually functionally expressed. For the most part, you know, we're seeing what we're expected to see. Um, smooth muscle cells, macrophages, lymphatic cells, and subcrypt, TA cells, in, um, intestinal cell cells, bottom crypt, goblet cells, coonocytes as we go up. Um, for the vast majority, the bottom heat, heat map says the same thing. Uh, well, there are genes that are uh, very similar in the crypt wherever you are in, in, in the column, whether you're proximal, middle, or distal. But there are some genes, that, and those are denoted bold in the right-hand um, right side of each of the bottom uh, dot plots. Um, those are the genes that are actually very much connected to um, the function, specific function of the crypts in the different parts of, of the column. So while the crypt in, one minute. on its own, um, uh, you know, it, it's uh, very um, uh, similar, there are some subtle differences. Um, I think the most important part is to uh, infer multicellular programs. So these are combinations of genes that are most highly uh, correlated to each other as time passes. 
Um, uh, for the purpose of time, I will just say that these multicellular programs um, are very important um, uh, to denote as we try to deconvolve aging. Um, and we can see the activity of these uh, multicellular programs, uh, so combinations of genes and cell types on the right-hand side, and we can actually figure out which combinations now of genes contribute to this uh, program in the bottom dot plots. I'll just say that as the colon ages, the subcrypt is very much defined by um, a signature of God blood cells that actually predetermine a malignant state. Um, at two years of age. Um, in summary, uh, what we have shown here is that uh, complementary data modality, so histology and gene expression, can be leveraged together for effective deconvolution of ST data. That our model CSPLOTCH integrates that data well uh, for um, exploring expression in very large data sets. Uh, that downstream analysis can tell you a lot about the inferred both composition and function of the colon, and that we are uh, very much in the process of posting our preprint. With this, I will end and thank uh, many funders, mentees, and mentors over the years, and I'm happy to take any questions in the Q&A in the next few minutes. So thank you again for the invitation. Thank you, Sonia. There are a couple questions there, and maybe in the interest of time, if you could answer them in writing, they're relatively short. That would be great. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, with, that, with this, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, I'm happy to welcome Dr. Liat Karen, uh, Karen uh, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology at Weizmann Institute of Science. Her lab combines novel high dimensional imaging methods with advanced computational analysis, artificial intelligence, and clinical co collaborations to achieve in-depth understanding of systemic transcellular interactions and to ultimately develop better treatments and diagnostics. Liat, welcome. Thank you, Ellen. Let me share my screen one moment. Okay, Perfect. does that look well? Yes, looks great, thank you. Okay, thank you. So hi everyone, I'm very excited um, to speak here today and thank you for the organizers for the invitation. Um, so I'll talk today about our work uh, on in multiplexed imaging for next generation pathology. So our lab is generally interested in the tumor microenvironment and the tumor microenvironment is incredibly complex. It contains many, many, many different kinds of cells and it's really interactions between all of these cells that drive interesting phenotypes that we're interested in understanding such as tumor progression or response to treatment. And like many others in the field and we just heard a, a beautiful talk from Sanja, um, we've turned into we've turned to multiplexed imaging because we want to be able to see all these different cell types and the way that we're, they're interacting in situ. Um, however, differently from what was just presented, we don't look at the RNA level, but we look at proteins. And so, in the last couple of years, uh, different approaches for multiplexed imaging have been devised, which allow us to visualize dozens of proteins in situ. And our lab has been uh, using these quite extensively in order to um, show different properties of tumors. However, the problem with these protein multiplexing techniques is that they are inherently limited. So let's uh, spend just a moment to talk about existing technologies. So existing technologies for uh, imaging proteins in situ are basically divided into two, I would say, major categories, and then the different approaches fall into these. The first category is cyclic fluorescent approaches. Um, whereby you take antibodies that can recognize a specific epitope that you're interested in seeing in the tissue, um, you stain with them, and you image using fluorescence. The problem, of course, is that with fluorescence, we can't multiplex more than three, uh, maybe four if you really try hard, proteins at a time. And so if you want to get to um, higher multiplexing capabilities, what you need to do is you need to do this in an iterative process, whereby you stain, you image, you remove, and really the different methods um, differ in, in how exactly they do this um, cyclic process. 
The other type of approaches are mass spec based approaches. Again, very similarly to the fluorescence based approaches, they will use antibodies, only now we will conjugate these antibodies not to fluorophores, but rather to uh, different metal isotopes. And currently we have around 40 or 50 uh, metal isotopes that we can conjugate to antibodies and then we can image them. Of course, we can't image them using a microscope because they're metals, but what we do is we go over the tissue pixel by pixel, raster it and send the material into a mass spectrometer and thereby we can identify the presence of these metals in the tissue and again there are different technologies that kind of fall under this um, mass spec umbrella but the problem of all these approaches that i've just described is that they scale linearly and what does that mean that they scale um, linearly so let's take a look at a standard staining scheme okay which is depicted here in this matrix so let's imagine that i have a microscope and it has three channels red green and blue so using these uh, channels i can measure three proteins protein one on the red channel protein two in the green channel etc so if i have n channels i will be able to measure uh, n proteins on the other hand, uh, if I use what is called combinatorial staining, I can actually increase the number of proteins. So now not using just a single channel for each protein, but rather using a few channels. So for example, having protein four stained both on the red and the green channel and having the red channel depict signals from proteins one, four, five, and seven. And if you apply combinatorial staining and you have N channels, now you can, uh, using these N channels, measure two to the power of N proteins, which means that you've exponentially increased the number of proteins that you can image. And we're not to th the first to think about this combinatorial staining. So this type of approach is really what has um, pioneered um, approaches for imaging RNA in situ, such as merfish or secfish, which have successfully enabled to image now hundreds and even thousands of mRNAs in situ. So if this works so well for uh, mRNAs, why isn't combinatorial staining applied to proteins? So the big challenge with combinatorial staining is that it requires non-overlapping signal. And I wanna illustrate that using an example. So let's imagine you have a piece of tissue and you've stained it using this combinatorial scheme that I just presented. And let's say these are the images that you got, okay? Very simplified images. They only have nine pixels and they've stained for your three channels, red, green, and blue. Of course, your next task would be to now understand which proteins are located in these pixels. So if you um, state that there is no overlap between proteins, then the task is very easy. It's just basically a lookup table, right? So let's imagine this top right pixel. We go, we see that it's staining for green and red. We go to the table, we see that red and green is protein four. And we can say that we have here staining of protein four. And in the bottom left, we have staining for protein five. However, if we now have the exact same image, but we do allow for overlap of proteins, we face a problem because this top right pixel now can be protein four, but it could also be a combination of proteins one and two. It could also be a pro combination of proteins one and four, one, two, and four, et cetera. And similarly for this bottom pixel. So basically, if you allow for overlapping signal, the problem is underdetermined. And for the more mathematically inclined people in the uh, uh, crowd, it's, it's very simple uh, high school algebra. So what we're trying to do here is we're trying to solve three equations with seven variables. And of course, this has an infinite number of solutions. So what's the problem with proteins? The problem with proteins is that they are roughly 10,000 fold more abundant than mRNAs in our cells. And so this assumption of non-overlapping signal, which can be held for a lot of the mRNAs, really um, falls apart when you try to image proteins. So perhaps for that reason so far, uh, this has not been attempted. So one of the things that we thought about when we approached this problem was maybe we can use the structure in the images to constrain the solution. And again, I wanna exemplify what do we mean by structure with this um, example that I showed you before. So let's imagine again that we have this um, image here, the very simplified and we allow for overlap, but now I give you a little bit more information. So what information? For example, I tell you that protein one, I now give it a name, it's CD20 and it's expressed in B cells. Protein two is CD3 and it's expressed in T cells and the two should not be co-expressed, okay? So this is prior knowledge that I have about the system. So now if I go back to my image, I can say, okay, so uh, for this pixel, this solution of having protein one and protein two together is, is highly improbable. And so probably what I'm seeing here is staining for protein four. 
Let's look at another example for uh, types of constraints that could constrain my solution. So let's say that now the image is slightly altered, okay? So now I have this stripe of red and this stripe of uh, green over here. And again, I'm trying to infer this top right pixel. Now I actually have pixels in the image which are defined because these images only have staining for one protein. So for example, this top left pixel is only staining red. And for that reason, it can only be protein one. Similarly here, it can only be protein two. And now if I try and infer this top right pixel, I can again say, okay, maybe the solution of protein four is less probable and it's more probable that it's an overlap of proteins one and two, because we know that biological images need to be continuous, right? So an expression in a pixel needs to be somehow similar to the expression of the pixels next to it. So our idea in this project was to see if we could perform combinatorial staining and use the structure that we have in biological images to constrain the solution space to then understand uh, the underlying protein um, expression. And this was undertaken by a really fantastic group from my lab, uh, Raz Benuri, Lior Ben Shabbat, Dana Sheinshine, Ofer El Khanani, and Shai Begon from the Weizmann AI Center. And so we call this approach approach complex, which stands for combinatorial multiplexing. And what we're trying to do here is we're trying to take a tissue, stain it uh, with a compression matrix or so with a, a, a compressed staining scheme, then take this piece of tissue to our measurement system, be it fluorescence or mass-based, any of them. What we will get out of this is we will get these combinatorially um, compressed images where each one of the channels contains agglomerated staining of different proteins. And our goal is now to be able to take these um, compressed images and decompress them back to the individual proteins. This is what we're trying to do. Okay, so in order to test that, what we did is we started with a publicly available uh, data set of colorectal cancer. In it, we had 41 fields of view uh, staining for 22 proteins. Each one of them was stained in isolation. And we imagined, we'll say, we did simulations. We said, let's imagine that we stained it, uh, these 22 proteins and only five channels. We'll simulate the compressed images. And because this is all simulations, we have the compressed images and we have the ground truth so we can evaluate our approach. So how do we actually do this? How do we um, decompress? So here we went to the literature and we were very happy to see that we're not the first to, to think about these problems and some very beautiful work, uh, primarily from Brian, Brian Cleary and Aviv Regev, and um, also Fei Chen, who is um, here on the Zoom, ha has previously tackled such similar problems and they've used compressed sensing in order to do this. So what is constraint compressed sensing? Compressed sensing is, is very similar to what I told you before. It's let's imagine we have this big solution space and we're now trying um, uh, to find a specific solution inside it. If we now start constraining this space, hopefully this will lead us in the right uh, direction. Um, so we tried using compressed sensing with all kinds of uh, constraints for sparsity and continuity. And here you can see the results, which unfortunately were not very good. Um, so I'm going to walk you through these plots because I'll show you um, a few plots that look similar to this. So here we're showing uh, one protein. This is alpha smooth muscle actin. Um, in green, you can see uh, the ground truth staining. And in purple, you can see our prediction. And in white, you can see the overlap. And the more white there is in the image, the better our algorithm is doing. The more green there is, we're missing signal. The more purple there is, we're inventing signal. And the bottom image is just a zoom in of the top image. Um, and here at the top, you can see the F1 score, which is measuring the overlap between the ground truth and our prediction. And you can see that the results are, are not very good. This is for one protein. And here I'm showing you a couple of more. And this is quantified for the entire 22 proteins. So on the y-axis here, I'm showing you the F1 scores across our, all of our test set. Um, and on the x-axis, you can see the different proteins. And again, ideally, if our algorithm was performing well, we would like to see all of this at one, but you can see that it doesn't. And so for the second part, for the second time in this project, we were thinking, okay, may, maybe this is the end of the road. Maybe this is not a good approach. And here, I'm just going to turn to the students in the audience, and I'll say that this was a part of the project, but we were stuck for a really, really long time. So we were thinking and we were adding constraints and we were formulating them and we were playing with them. Um, so if you are currently in your projects in kind of this uh, phase, um, uh, I'll just say that that we all go we all go through it. 
Um, and so it, it's obviously not the end of the road, otherwise I, I would not uh, be presenting it. But one thing that we've realized really after being stuck here for a while was that our priors are just not good enough, okay? So what are really properties of protein expression that can constrain the solution space? Um, so what do we know about biological signals? One thing that we know about biological signals is that they're sparse, okay? So here I'm showing you staining for a CD8 positive cell, and most of the pixels in the image are black, and just a few of them are on. Um, there is this property that we've already discussed of continuity, whereby expression of pixels should be similar to the pixels nearby. There are these rules of co-expression. All CD8 cells are positive for CD45, but not the other way around. But there was also, we, we, we understood after a while, this kind of vague concept of morphology, which is how these proteins look like. Okay, so here I'm showing you a staining of two proteins. One is Ki67, which is a nuclear protein, and the other is pan-keratin, which is expressed in the cytosol and in the membrane. And you can really appreciate how different uh, both of these stains look, and they look so different to the extent that, you know, if we would just put them together on a grayscale image and show this to a biologist or a pathologist, they will easily tell us which, you know, which of these stains belongs to Ki67 and which to pan-keratin. But the problem with all of these constraints is that they're really very difficult to encode explic explicitly. However, uh, neural networks can uh, learn these. And so we've turned the approach around and we've decided to use supervised learning to see if we could use that for decompression. So we trained a convolutional neural network that takes these compressed images and tries to predict the individual protein images. Now, for technical reasons that I'm not going to go into, uh, we did it as a two-step process. It turned out working better. One was the first stage was a masking network, which tries to predict where the protein is binding, so basically a binary mask. And then after that, we actually do the second phase, which is very similar to the compressed sensing, which is least squares optimization of really quantifying how much expression we have for each protein, which leads us to the final prediction. And here you can see now the results of applying complex on the same images that I've shown you before. This is again, this image of smooth muscle axton. Um, and here are the other proteins and you can see that it does remarkably well. So almost everything is white. And if we will now quantify this across all of the 22 different proteins, you can see here are the F1 scores, which are really high, very close to one. Um, and here on the right, you can see the Pearson correlation. So this is just another measure for how well we're doing. Um, and again, very, very high agreement between the ground truth data and our reconstructed data. So it works in silico. Of course, the next big thing was to see if we can implement this experimentally. So I'll rush a little bit um, here for time. What we did is we um, used Codex um, and uh, now built a system in which we experimentally compress seven proteins to three channels. So we took seven proteins, and importantly, these are proteins that are a very plausible immune oncology panel, and they also should be co-expressed, okay? So CD8 and CD45 should be co-expressed, KI67, 353 should be co-expressed. So it's not an easy test case, okay? It's a realistic test case. Um, and we stain a piece of tissue with them uh, twice, one using just three channels, so in a compressed manner, uh, using uh, multiple reporters per antibody, but then we do a second staining, which is really measuring each protein individually as is conventionally done, and, and again, we use codex for this, and so putting these two together, we have both the ground truth and the compressed images. So here you can see that this works experimentally. So we get these three different um, channels. Each one of them is a combination of proteins. And if we now overlay the single proteins on them, you can see that really the composite image is uh, comprised of these different proteins. So we were able to experimentally multiplex these proteins. Now we took a breast carcinoma TMA and we stained it. We used some of the cores for training and the others for testing. We applied complex. And here again, this is now experimentally. You can see that it does really very nicely uh, with very, very high F1 scores and a very high um, Pearson correlation. Um, we've then extended it. So I've shown you a compression of seven proteins to three channels. We wanted to go further. So we also did um, the same as in our in silico experiment. We um, took 22 proteins and measured them in five channels. And again, here you can see an example of one such image and you can see really how nicely it works. And again, with very, very high F1 scores, high Pearson correlations. Then we turned to a different approach, uh, Mibitoff, which is a mass spec based approach. 
and again, applied it uh, and, and devised the experiment to do this also on MIBI. And here also in MIBI, you can see that it does very well. These mass-based approaches tend to give you such a pixelated signal. So you can see this here. Um, and so we were, we were really excited about that. Um, one of the things that we wondered after using it, so we thought this is great, but of course the Achilles heel of the approach is that you need to train it, okay? And, and for training, you need these kind of paired of compressed data and um, single channel images, uh, which is not very easy to get. So we were wondering maybe we could use simulated data in order to recover experimentally compressed signals. So basically what we want to do is instead of requiring uh, both the compressed images and the ground truth, we want to just take available data that people uh, measured using codex, using MIBI, using any other multiplexing approach, and see if we could train in that and then predict uh, compressed images. And we've devised uh, a simulation approach. Again, for time, I'm not going to go into the details. You can find it in the um, uh, preprint. Um, and then we used our approach in order to decompress it and see what we do. And so here you can see the results when we train with the actual compressed data. So this is what I've shown you before. And here you can see the results when we train with simulated data. And again, you can appreciate that we do quite well. Uh, one of the things that we noticed when we did this is that our lowest results really had very, very few um, missed cells. Uh, so cells that we could not identify, for example, the one that I'm showing you here. And really, these are the things that we care about, right? Because if you think about what is the downstream analysis of, of such approaches, and as we've heard beautifully in the talk before, what we want to do is we want to segment these cells, we want to classify them, we want to say, you know, is it positive or negative, or how much does it express of a particular um, protein? So really cases where we miss completely cells or, in, or invent cells are, are problematic, whereas cases like the cells over here, where we kind of miss a little bit of signal on the outskirts of the cells are, are not really um, very important. And so what we did is we took these images uh, through the entire uh, pipeline, either the ground truth images or our predictions. We segmented the cells, we classified them. Here specifically, I'm showing you an example for CD8 positive uh, T cells. So uh, CD8s here are shown in yellow and all other cells are shown in blue. And you can see that when we do this on the ground truth of the prediction, the images are basically identical. And we can measure this again using balanced accuracy and we see that we get very, very high um, results. Um, so for the last, do I have a minute, Ellen? I'll take it as yes. Yeah, one minute. Quick. One minute, perfect. Okay, so for the last minute of the talk, I want to talk um, uh, very briefly about why does this actually work? What does the network learn? So we've invested a lot of time in looking into that. Um, one thing that we found, which is not very interesting, is that complex learns the compression matrix. It's uh, pretty trivial. Uh, we've also found that complex learns spatial continuity. So we took we had experiments where we took pixels and we shuffled them across all of the different channels. And what we saw that was that if we do a shuffle of one pixel, we completely lose our ability to reconstruct the signal. Whereas if we do larger patches, then um, we have very good reconstruction, which really means that you know this network is really using the morphology. It's using this spatial coherence, spatial continuity. Um, we've also seen, which is really nice, and this is the last thing I'll show, is that complex learns how proteins look like, okay? So we did the experiment, the mental experiment that I've shown you before. We took two proteins, uh, Ki67 and smooth muscle actin, that look very differently. And we've generated composite images of just the two of them, okay? So here the network really doesn't have anything else. It doesn't have co-expression. It, it really needs to learn how these proteins look like. And it does a very, very good job in um, predicting them, meaning that it really has now a grasp of how these proteins should look like, where they're expressed in the cells, how abundant they are, et cetera. Um, I'll skip this for time and I'll just summarize. So I've shown you that we've developed complex, which is combinatorial staining to image proteins in situ. Uh, we can use it to compress 22 proteins into five channels. Uh, it works in fluorescence microscopy. It works in mass-based imaging. And all of this is really possible due to the structure in biological images. And in the future, we're very excited that this approach could potentially really increase the multiplexing capability uh, for proteins as similar approaches have done for mRNA. And with that, I want to thank my wonderful group. I've thanked the people who've done the work um, along the way. This is us um, in um, a costume party dressed as antibodies conjugated to metal tags. And of course, thank you to our funding sources and thank you for listening. 
Thanks so much, Liat. If anyone has questions to Liat, please ask them in a Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen. Uh, with this, I would, love to, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Alan Mullen. He's a professor of medicine, the Mary DeFudis Chair in Biomedical Research and Academic Chief of the Division of Gastroenterology at the University of Massachusetts Chan Medical School. He is also a coordinator of the HCA Liver a Biological Network. Alan's lab focuses on unraveling molecular mechanisms controlling liver fibrosis. Alan, welcome and thank you. Okay, well, hey, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk to you today about the work and and, and certainly um, want to also start off by just mentioning, um, as, as Ellen said, I'm part of the liver um, seed and uh, pediatric networks. So um, you know, this is certainly a, an important collaboration between a lot of different groups. And, and if anyone is interested in connecting with the liver side of things, certainly you can reach out to, to me or to Gary Bader. Um, or or reach out to either one of us directly to the HCA. We'd we'll be happy to connect with more people um, doing work on the, the liver side of things. Um, so so what I wanted to do today was was to, uh, talk about work we've been doing um, in in developing MRF fish for analysis uh, in human liver. Um, to discuss a bit of how we've gone about defining the cell types with MRF fish, going through uh, some of the stages of development and some of the problems that we've had in terms of getting this up and running uh, in, in the human liver. Um, and then discussing a bit about what we can do because of the, the uh, subcellular um, imaging we can we do looking at both nuclear content and, and gene expression and hepatocytes. Uh, and then just some some initial or some early data at the end uh, comparing healthy and, and cirrhotic liver uh, using the MRF fish. Uh, and and so, you know, we decided in the beginning, what we really wanted to do was try to make sure we could, when we were doing spatial transcriptomics, to be able to look at a, at a single cell level and, it, and ideally eventually being able to look at where nuclear and cytoplasmic uh, fractionation of these transcripts are. And so, so to do that, we've done this as a collaboration with, with Jeff Moffat at Boston Children's Hospital, uh, with one of his postdocs, Brianna Watson, uh, as well. And, and this, the layout of MRFish, um, which is similar to Seekfish as well, is um, I think been already described nicely in terms of the concepts, but just very briefly, uh, what, what we do with these approaches, we take tissue, in this case, liver tissue. Uh, these are usually normal or normal tissue margins from resections of, of from, from other types of you know, tumors or other reasons, benign or malignant tumors in the liver. Uh, we identify normal tissue margins and, and then we can section those um, those are going to be bound by probes uh, that have tails on them, and those those tails can then be bound by uh, secondary probes with fluorescent markers. And so, if you look here on the left, uh, you can see an example of five different little transcripts. You know, three of those were bound by probes. Uh, you can then go back and quench or cleave those fluorescent markers uh, at, with those probes, and go back and repeat that staining again. And by doing that in serial. Uh, staining and quenching, uh, you can develop a barcode for each individual pixel that would represent an individual RNA. Uh, and by doing that, we can then build the the transcriptome um, and what for the for those target genes uh, in that specific uh, tissue section. And in this case, we're really focused on hepatocytes. Uh, these are the major cell types in the liver. Um, and let me just uh, uh, as one of the, the, the main cell types, uh, that we're going to, to see if we look at the imaging of the liver. So we, in, in choosing the data that we wanted to first look at, we, we focus mainly on probe sets that would tell us more about hepatocytes. Uh, this is a, a very nice, uh, image that, that Sonia McParland published a number of years ago with one of the earliest, um, single cell, uh, sequencing data sets. And just to give an idea of the structure of the liver and what we'll be looking at with some of these sections. Um, you can see on the right uh, an example of uh, a lobule, and if you look on the left, there's the portal vein, uh, the bile duct. That's where the blood and through the hepatic artery and portal vein will enter into the these small lobule structures. The liver flow through the sinusoids and then approach the central vein. And the hepatocytes here marked in red um, with increasing kind of uh, coloration intensity towards uh, the central vein indicate you know a change in the behavior of those cells and a zonation uh, that we see um, in in the hepatocytes uh, and it's been well described. And one thing we would wanna be able to pick up by the, the, the MRFish analysis. There are certainly other cell types in the liver, just a few to mention. Um, you will have endothelial cells that form the lining of the vessels of the sinusoids. Uh, there are immune cells, both macrophages uh, called Cooper cells and other resident macrophages, uh, as well as uh, larger immune populations and hepatic stellate cells uh, and then uh, cholangiocytes as well. And so what we wanted to make sure is that we could really capture that, that 
distribution um, using spatial transcriptomics. And I like to start with this slide just to give an idea of some of the the, the the difficulties in, in transferring uh, the Murfish protocol to, to human liver. Um, in the very beginning, Biplap, who was a postdoc in the lab, took the protocol, applied it first to uh, hepatic stellate cells, which we're looking on the top, and just tried to probe uh, for a single transcript. In this case, he's looking at colon A1 messenger RNA. Now, it told us that the protocol was working fine, all the reagents were active. And when he went to do this in human liver, he saw a very different result. And, and what we are seeing here is the the bleed through of lipofuscin as an autofluorescence in really every channel that we looked at that was not dependent in any way on in the RNA activity or RNA um, wasn't picking up any RNA. Uh, it was actually more of a, a, a de debris that it was really hard to digest and certainly becomes more prominent um, with age uh, in, in patients if we're looking at the, at the liver. Not so much of an issue we see in mice, but in, in certainly the human livers where their patients are decades of age, uh, we do see this autofluorescence as a major issue. So that was one thing we really had to spend a lot of time trying to optimize uh, early on. And in the end, we found that if we photo bleached with LED lights for about 24 hours, we could remove most of that autofluorescence and allow us to, to actually be able to visualize RNA transcripts in, that, in the protocol. And, and so what we're looking at here is just one um, section of staining. So this is one of 12 rounds of staining that, that were performed. The blue is showing DAPI, which are the nuclei. Those larger round nuclei are associated with hepatocytes. Uh, and then you can see, I think I'm going to pull up my pointer here, um, that, that if you look here, so these are larger nuclei or hepatocytes, the white dots, everyone represents the transcript. Uh, and then here, these smaller nuclei here most likely represent macrophages. And some of these smaller ones here along the edges of the sinusoids uh, may very well be hepatic stellate cells. Um, so we could then at least feel more confident that we were able to, to see staining um, of the RNA transcripts once we got rid of that fluorescent. But, but the other problem we certainly is a challenge with many of these approaches is segmentation. And you know, if we do single cell RNA sequencing or we do um, single nuclear RNA sequencing, you know, we're bringing individual cells largely into droplets and and doing the reaction for for labeling and 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 um, uh, expansion of those probes for sequencing. But when we look at tissue, we're seeing really everything spread out um, over a, a, a geographic distribution. And, and there are a number of approaches uh, that, that have been developed to try to use that to define cell boundaries. So if we look here in the middle, um, middle top, you know, this is sort of an example of what we were initially looking at. We see nuclei, and then we see transcripts as dots, but it's harder to define those cell boundaries. Uh, we can take advantage of, of protocols and pipelines that have been developed. Baser is one of those that has worked very well for us. Um, and what that's essentially doing is it's looking at the distribution of the combination of RNA transcripts and looking for where those areas change. And then so those transitions would expect to define cell boundaries. And in many ways, that can help us you know, to identify and predict where those cell boundaries are. The problem is we can visualize and see examples where that didn't quite make sense. Um, and, and so what we've done also is added back in as the last step of barcoding an antibody that has a barcode on it that recognizes a sodium potassium ATPase uh, on the surface membrane. And now what we can do is define those boundaries as a, the last round of staining. So now, you know, in this example at the top center, you know, we might have predicted there are three cells with this um, distribution of RNA. Now that we can define the cell boundaries, we see this a little bit different. And this can get further complicated when you consider that hepatocytes also can be multinucleated. So I'm just going to go to, as I'm just indicating by that second dot. And, and so this is, a, a, again, the sort of the, the final level where we are right now in terms of the way we're staining for murfish. We can see what we're showing on the left side, which is, again, an example where we can see individual dots representing those RNA transcripts. We can stain for the nuclei. Um, and then as the last round of staining, which I just colored in green here on the right, uh, we can use, again, an antibody that has a barcode attached to it that we can pick up with that last round of staining to identify those, those boundaries. And if you look in the middle here, think you can see an example of what we're talking about where you can see multinucleated hepatocytes um, as well as the single nucleated ones here. I'm just circling some examples. So, um, but this allows us by combining both the baser um, and the cell pose to, to make a better prediction of where those boundaries are and, and to improve the segmentation that we were seeing. So now that we have that, we can go back and 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 look at the 
the major cell types in the liver. This is uh, a UMAP projection taking all of the cells that have been defined by using 317 genes uh, to define primarily hepatocytes, but they also contain enough to enough, a small number of genes to identify macrophages, hepatic stellate cells, cholangiocytes, and the liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. Uh, we do get more reads and more cells. This is an example of looking at three uh, samples of, of human liver, which are, uh, we can get over 100,000 cells from, from those samples. So more, more data than we usually see in terms of cell number from a run of, of, of single nuclear RNA sequencing. Uh, we can plot these both in, um, here on the left, we're looking at hepatocytes. Uh, and you can see quite clearly, even if we're not trying to look at zonation by itself, uh, we can see that there are three areas uh, defined as three different zones for hepatocytes. So there's, uh, you know, we can see both a more portal area moving through a, a, a intermediate area to to a more a central area based on uh, just looking at the gene expression uh, and, and plotting these as UMAPs. But now we can also go back and look at those in the tissue. Um, and what we wanted to make sure we could see was that we would see normal patterns of zonation uh, that, that have been described and, and by a number of groups looking at these by uh, by a number of very nice approaches, both um, looking at smaller versions of fish or by by looking at gene expression um, across the liver. So if we're looking here on the left, we're staining for a, a, a gene a product uh, called SDS. This tends to be expressed in periportal areas or the areas where the blood flow from the hepatic artery and the portal artery enter the, the liver. Um, we can see these clustered around areas here, you know, around here, uh, around here, and these generally tend to clear out right at those portal areas. And then we're, we're seeing, again, definitely much more intense staining uh, around those immediate portal areas. Uh, CYP2A6 is a gene that's expressed in, in hepatocytes as well and tends to also be periportal. And again, it shows a very similar pattern of expression there across that tissue sample. We can also look at other genes that we know should be more periportal, I'm sorry, more pericentral. Um, CYP2E1 and CYP1A2 both um, have been described as pericentral genes. So these are ones that are closer to the central vein. And again, we can see very nicely here that these are separated um, and, and staining um, in those, those areas around the central vein. So again, as we would expect in the, these first couple of examples, we're, we're really to make sure that we, we were getting the zonation we were expecting uh, based on uh, what we, we knew about the, the, the structure of the liver. Um, we can also then take and look at the expression of individual transcripts across the zone, liver zone. So here we're looking at that periportal area on top and the pericentral area on bottom. Uh, again, looking at a gene ASS1 now that is expressed in a more periportal area. I think you can see a gradient and we're looking at here in just a histogram mapping the density, uh, again, from the portal area down to the central area. Um, and CYP2E1, again, doing just the opposite in terms of gene expression patterns, going from a very low expression in the periportal area uh, and peaking at the, the pericentral area. Uh, this is just an example of, of a number of, of other genes that we're seeing following that pattern. But what I wanted to highlight was the, the heat map on the right. And so it's not really that there is, in many ways, you know, we talk about the zonation, it, the zonation is really a continuum. Um, we're not the first people to, to say this, other people have shown this in, in data sets for mouse. Um, and, but, but what I think is quite striking here is we're looking at uh, the top um, 55, I think, differentially expressed genes that change with zonation. And if you start up here on the top, these are the genes that are enriched in the periportal area, and you move down towards the bottom, where we see zonation or the gene expression mix more enriched in the central area, there are not you know clear transitions, but we see a gradual shift in, in gene expression patterns going from the periportal to pericentral areas, uh, and then this is recapitulated very nicely again visually um, if we, we we map back into the individual tissue. So you know once we do that, we can identify those individual cell types. I was showing with the the gene expression before; those are RNA transcripts, but now we can map those back into cells. Um, and we're looking at a zoomed out view of a section of liver. And, and again, I think it's quite clear. We get the purple areas indicating the portal area. Brown is the zone two area, the intermediate zone. And, and pink is the area moving into the central vein. Uh, and it's it's really striking. We found if we actually go and zoom in to a much higher resolution, uh, these gradients are pretty clear. Uh, we're looking at on the, the right side, you know, purple again, or zone one defined 
zone two is in brown, uh, zone three or that pericentral area is, is pink. And we're looking at uh, examples from, from two different sections of, of human samples and healthy liver. And, and these, again, the, these gradients, while there's a gradient there, the, the, the definition of these zones is pretty, um, I, again, fairly distinct. And we're, we're, we were really uh, quite impressed in the, the way these were able to be separated uh, with, with uh, you know, not a huge number, but around 200, uh, about 315 genes there. Um, I'm just showing this to mention that we were uh, and can map other cell types as well. Uh, we're, we're seeing macrophages, hepatic stellate cells, cholangiocytes, and liver sinusoidal endothelial cells uh, with that mapping as well. But I was going to focus mainly on the hepatocytes. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we, we also see uh, with the advantage of staying for DAPI and defining cell boundaries and the RNA transcripts, that we can identify cells in the hepatocyte population that are multinucleated um, or single nucleated here. And if you look at the white arrows, these are two examples of multinucleated hepatocytes that we can see in the data. Uh, and if we look at those, that distribution, we see something you know, very similar to what's been reported um, by many of the groups who've looked at uh, the nuclear content in the liver, that about a third of um, hepatocytes are multinucleated. Uh, and, and again, the majority are single nucleated, but this certainly has implications if we think about single nuclear RNA approaches where we're separating individual nuclei uh, and, and looking at those and treating them as individual cells uh, where they may or may not be. Um, and and uh, this does allow us to, to start looking at some of the differences between those, those multinucleated and single nucleated hepatocytes. So one question we had was whether or not these hepatocytes uh, in terms of the zone, in terms of the single rosis multinucleated uh, were distributed evenly across the, the zonation of the liver or if they were enriched in certain areas. Uh, and the short of what we found is that there's that there is no bias in terms of zonation. What we're looking on the left side is a distribution in orange versus green of you know, all of the hepatocytes that have one nucleus versus those that have two, three, or four. Uh, we do not see any enrichment towards any specific zones. And if we look at those the counts in terms of the, the transcript levels, we see that as you increase the number of nuclei, you increase the amount of transcripts. Uh, but if we try to control for the cell size, we find that that isn't really changing much. So that if you are a multinucleated cell, you tend to have a larger cell and you tend to have more transcripts that are proportional. Um, but there's no, and I didn't show this data here, there's no difference in differential expression across the, the single or multinucleated hepatocytes. Um, we're oh, still working. One minute, please. Okay, great. Thanks. And we're still working now to try to separate nuclear transcripts versus cytoplasmic transcripts. Um, the last thing I wanted to point out is that we can take this into uh, disease liver. Um, and, and what we're finding is we map the both the MRFish using looking at healthy and disease. We can identify populations that are unique to the disease state. So here we're looking at a, a merge of all the MRFish data from healthy and cirrhotic liver. Um, if we look at just the healthy, we can see these two populations are really underrepresented compared to the the, the um, merge. And these represent what we think are two um, new hepatocyte populations that are developing with disease. Those tend not to be distributed. I'm just going to show focus here on the right. They tend to be diffusely spread throughout the liver. They don't follow that zonation pattern. And, and we can now go back and begin to do analysis looking at some differential expression between those. Uh, we're now combining that with NUCSI to merge the data to, to get a better idea of the full transcriptome because here in this case, again, we're looking at about 317 cells as a way of, of defining those cell types. Um, so in summary, again, we feel like spatial transcriptomics using MRFish is now allow us to place individual cells within the structure of the liver, uh, again, with information on the expression of hundreds of genes here, uh, but, but we think we should be able to get to at least 1,000 genes with this approach. Um, we can identify multinucleated hepatocytes. Uh, as I described, they tend to have more expression of transcripts. We don't see differential expression, uh, and that seems to go along with the size and the transcript, or the size of the cells. And finally, that we're observing new hepatocyte populations with liver injury that don't retain their zonation. Um, and I kind of highlighted the people who had present, who had done most of the work as we went along. So I'll just um, leave a slide up here and, and stop here and I appreciate everyone's attention. Thanks so much, Alan. There are a couple of questions for you in the Q&A. If there are more, please do submit your questions and Alan will try to answer. With this, I would like to introduce our new next speaker. Uh, Dr. Fei Chen is an assistant professor at the Harvard Department of Stem Cell and Regenerative Biology and a core faculty member at the Broad Institute. The Chen Lab sets out to build a set of tools which will bridge single cell genomics. Um, 
with with space and time to enable discoveries of where cell types are localized within intact tissues when relevant transcriptional modules are active. To do this, the lab is developing novel technologies at the intersection of microscopy, genomics, and synthetic biology. Faye, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, thank you for that great introduction and uh, super excited to be here. So as, as um, as Ellen said, we're, our lab is developing a lot of tools that bridge the world of genomics and, and microscopy. And since we're running uh, a little bit behind on time, I'll just dive right into it. Um, the idea is that um, I think the reason why many of us are excited and, and what, what the pre previous two talks have really highlighted is that uh, in the past uh, decade or so, there's been this immense revolution in sequencing technologies uh, that's really powered empowered for example, um, this whole human cell atlas effort, because now uh, we've gone from sequencing genomes to sequencing single cells, and we can start defining regulatory pathways and cell type definitions. And um, this this process has has been given us many promising leads about disease and complex biological systems, but it's been a little bit challenging to bridge it to the real world of tissues because we often have to go and dissociate those cells. Uh, and then, as you know, tissues um, are not slurries of single cells. They are composed of uh, cells which are interacting with each other, which actually form structures that actually um, generate the function. And that's traditionally been in the world, um, studied been in the world of microscopy. And um, as you saw with the previous couple talks, maybe the theme of the session, the, world, the idea is to bridge these two worlds together to enable uh, us to uh, relate morphology, pathology, and other features into molecular definitions of tissues, uh, such as cell types, cell states, and cell programs. And um, to do that, we've been, um, in our group in the last uh, almost, um, yes, six or seven years or so, have been developing uh, tools that allow us to do this, uh, these sorts of measurements of genomics directly in the context of tissues. Uh, today, I'll, I'll really talk about sequencing-based tools where we can capture uh, cells or, or RNA or DNA and spatially localize it. Uh, but you just saw a beautiful talk of imaging-based tools uh, wherein you can directly label specific molecules. Uh, we, we for our, in our lab, have been interested in direct sequencing inside of tissues. Uh, for example, here sequencing um, you know, uh, DNA inside of the nucleus. And I, I think importantly, uh, you know, there's many questions uh, that that are are interesting, um, but um, some things that we're pr pretty interested in is defining uh, tissues as a composed of molecularly organized cell types, and then also relating uh, perhaps uh, gene expression and cell types uh, to pathology. And beyond just like looking at counts, I think, uh, one thing we aspire to is actually to sequence, like sequence, uh, whether that's the genome, the epigenome, and transcriptome. And, and so far, we've been focusing really mainly on tools that actually allow us to access uh, sequence information. And so today, I'll talk to you about um, um, this a, a new technology we've developed for for bridging the world of single cell and spatial. Uh, but but really, I want to we need to quickly introduce um, some technological foundations that was developed quite a while ago. Um, uh, which is SlideSeq, and its approach, uh, and it, this is an approach that we developed a while back, basically to make these high resolution barcoded arrays uh, of 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 capture sequence or or of beads. And how in SlideSeq how it works is that uh, we have ten micron polystyrene beads, and we can on each one of these beads are millions of oligonucleotides, and these oligos, um, you can think of the them having uh, kind of some set sequence where you might have a handle, uh, a poly T if you want to capture mRNA, and then uh, this thing called a spatial bead barcode. That's like what's actually important. It's a unique sequence of A's, C's, G's, and T's uh, that's unique for each, each bead, but different between beads. And, and the whole idea is that uh, we can take these beads and randomly deposit them into uh, these arrays. Here's an, uh, a cover slip with a three millimeter array with about 100,000 beads. And here's an EM image of the beads sitting on the surface. And the idea is that the beads are acting as pixels um, in like, just like the pixels of your camera. But instead of taking a picture, um, it's taking like capturing, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a picture of the molecules inside the tissue. But these beads are randomly deposited. And so to, to actually get the array, what we're doing is we're um, sequencing this bead barcode with kind of a custom microscope. But, um, 
just carrying out sequencing chemistries where colors represent bases. But at the end of the day, what's important is that you end up with um, at each XY location, the sequence of the bead barcode so that when you actually could then go and do the experiment, uh, for example, uh, when we originally developed this capture RNA, we can section a piece of tissue and put it on uh, these beads and the RNA diffuse onto the beads and get captured. Um, and then now you know when you sequence the library, uh, the locations of each one uh, of those uh, reads uh, to 10 micron resolution. And as I said, we've been quite interested in in these a couple of organization problems. Uh, like one is how are tissues organized in terms of molecularly defined cell types, uh, but also more also just as important, how do we relate gene expression uh, to spatial and sequence context, uh, in particular in the context of diseases uh, such as cancer. And uh, we've also been developing some computational algorithms. But today, I'm going to really uh, tell you about. Um, kind of this idea for bridging the world of, of, of single cell and spatial. Um, and so this is actually from the uh, Human Cell Atlas at white paper. Uh, the idea was that maybe, and this is, as you saw in all the, a couple of the previous talks, the idea has been to take um, a piece of tissue, dissociate it maybe and do single cell sequencing. Um, and, and another branch can go and do spatial transcriptomics and then integrate these two data. In fact, we, we did this for the mouse brain, uh, for example, to generate in a complete atlas of, of, of the mouse brain. And, and why are we doing this? Here in single cell, we can generate really high resolution, unbiased profiles, and then, um, but there's no spatial information. But when you do um, spatial transcriptomics, you get the spatial context, but oftentimes, uh, whether due to segmentation, whether due to targeted probes, you don't have uh, the molecular sensitivity uh, and or maybe more importantly, the molecular unbiasedness and diversity of single cell. And so the goal is to go and try to unify by these. And in an ideal world, you could just have, you know, uh, have your cake and eat it too, uh, which is, you know, if you could do single nucleus RNA sequencing or single cell RNA sequencing, you have high quality single cell measurements. I think an underlooked aspect of this is also there's quite an extensive toolbox, both from commercialization and also just the extensive single cell community of analysis and experimental tools to measure different modalities and to analyze the data. Um, but there's no spatial context. And in spatial transcriptomics profiling, uh, we get that spatial context, but um, in in oops, in slide seek, certainly we don't have um, you know we have high resolution, but we don't have true single cell resolution. And any even in imaging based approaches, you can see that um, segmentation also is 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 sometimes a challenge. Um, but you do have the spatial context. And so ideally, if you could spatially barcode the cells that you're actually sequencing, you can get uh, kind of the best of both worlds, maybe high quality single cell measurements as well as the, the spatial context. And so, so how are we, we doing that? Um, we developed an approach called slide tags. And basically this is really just like slide seek run backwards. And the idea is a little bit like GPS for cells, wherein we're going to diso um, we're going to take a piece of tissue and we're going to use the same barcoded arrays, but now instead of, um, we put the tissue on. Now, instead of capturing the RNA, what we're going to do is we're going to dissociate these bead barcode oligos um, off and into the nuclei. We, we have this approach that allows us to photo cleave them. They diffuse into these nuclei. And then uh, effectively, um, you can think of these beads as like satellites and they're releasing sequences of X, Y location and they get picked up by the cells. And each cell picks up like actually a distribution of spatial barcodes. Um, but then we perform standard single nucleus isolation and uh, profile on basically standard um, single cell platforms, for example, 10X. And what's actually happening inside of a single cell droplet in 10X, for example, is that in each nucleus, you have these barcodes that correspond to spatial location and then the mRNA, and you're associating them with the same 10X cell barcode. So that when you sequence those libraries, you get this bar spatial barcode library as well as a gene expression library, and then when you um, and 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 you're linking that information through the cell barcode, and so just to illustrate um, and benchmark the data, we we profiled the mouse hippocampus, which has a stereotyped architecture, and also like there's quite a lot of existing data to 
demonstrate the performance. And so we performed this sort of tagging approach and standard single nucleus RNA-seq. When you generate data like that, you will often generate these gene expression matrices of cells by genes. Um, as you know, we, we cluster those um, into, um, here's a dimensionality reduction UMAP that shows like each dot is a cell and they're colored by cell types or cell states. Um, I'll, I'll have the labels for you in a second, but um, you know, clusters represent cell types. But in addition to um, in addition to the gene expression, each one of these clusters also has some information about the satellite barcodes. And for example, this blue cell picked up a bunch of information from X equals 1,000 and Y equals 1,500. Um, and so you can actually go and fit. So you can see like each, each cell is not pick up one barcode. It picks up like a local distribution of barcodes. And so then you can go and fit those into X, Y coordinates. And here's actually the visualization for a single cell. You can see that it has two. Uh, this is a spatial plot of the distribution of uh, UMIs of spatial barcodes. And you can see it has this focal location. And then we fit the centroid of this Gaussian, which allows us to actually error correct uh, the localization. And so when we do that, we can take each one of these cells and actually place um, the cells into space. Like, you know, this is single cell data. We're just putting them back into the spatial context. And then that recapitulates known uh, tissue architecture and also underlying each one of these single cells is actually the gene expression of all the genes, right? And so you can go and plot those genes. And so, um, you know, just like some key metrics, uh, the data quality of, of slide tags is uh, virtually indistinguishable from single nucleus RNA-seq. So in a paired experiment, you can compare for, for example, cell type proportions, the number of UMIs per cell type um, and genes, um, was, you know, thousands of uh, transcripts per cell. And then here is um, the average expression for a given cell type, virtually unidentical. Um, the spatial resolution, because we're doing this like error correction, we think the spatial resolution is at least 10 microns. Um, and then here's an important uh, metric, which is the sampling de density. Uh, we think about 15% of nuclei in a 20 micron section are spatially placed. Um, and there's a couple of places where these, these are lost and where we think that we can improve this. But at 15 microns, um, I'll show you some analyses that it's it's going to be high enough to 15%, it's going to be high enough to profile biologically relevant structures and cell-cell interactions. And then um, I guess maybe for the interest of time, we'll, we'll skip this. This is just showing that uh, you know, single nucleus RNA-seq is quite high quality. It has high molecular sensitivity and it doesn't suffer from, from, from doublets. And so it has quite a lot of molecular information. And so, um, so the, the idea behind site tags is it's compatible with existing single nuclei sequencing technologies as well as analysis tools. And so, um, you know, the community really has developed all of these tools worth looking at expression, TCR sequences, copy number inference, uh, chromatin uh, accessibility, and so uh, we actually demonstrated a lot of that in, in a manuscript we, we published last year. But just to highlight the versatility of tags, I'll just look at, um, I'll just show you some data from metastatic melanoma where uh, we can show both like the single nucleus RNA-seq aspect of it, but as well as these multi-omic uh, aspect of it. And so here uh, we perform slight tags on a piece of uh, metastatic melanoma from from uh, a deceased patient. and. Um, here uh, is the histology for the sample. It, it, you can see that there's like these two lobes of the tumor separated by this fibrous um, stroma region. And uh, we perform slight tags on it. Here are the cell, cellular populations. Uh, you can see the, the immune clusters as well as kind of three clusters of tumor cells. We can place all of these into the spatial context of, of this um, tumor section. And um, it's a little bit hard to see with all, all of the cells labeled. Maybe let's just look at the tumor cells. The tumor cells, uh, we see that these transcriptionally distinct populations actually also spatially segregate uh, across uh, those two, two lobes, as well as there seems to be some local clustering of tumor 1B uh, versus 1A. And then we were also curious if there were cytogenetic differences between these subpopulations. So we used infer CNV. It's a method to infer copy number variation from transcriptome data. And so... Uh, red means uh, amplifications and blue means um, losses here. And you can see some shared copy number variation, like seven gain, um, as well as some private uh, like uh, losses, like the six loss unique to tumor one. And 
this is spatial data. So we can also uh, look at the cellular neighborhoods. And so here, for example, we're just looking at an enrichment or depletion of different uh, immune uh, subtype and stromal subtypes with respect to the tumor populations. And for example, red means enrichment and blue means depletion. You can see that there's a strong uh, enrichment of CD8 T cells uh, next to uh, the tumor two population, but depleted from, from tumor one. And so what's different? What are these uh, T cell states and receptors in these different neighborhoods? So if we perform differential expression, now this is spatial differential expression between T cells that are next to um, tumor two versus tumor one, you can see that uh, T cells in tumor two have a more cytotoxic phenotype. They're expressing granzyme B. And um, in tumor one, they're maybe a little bit more exhausted. And we can also recover the TCR sequences. So TCRs are um, the unique sequence of CDRs uh, that recognize um, antigens, and they can also really exist as like almost like a clonal barcode for, for a given T cell. You can see that, uh, for example, here, um, there's this clone, uh, there's an alpha and beta chain, and you know here this is a matching for each individual T cell. And here we can actually plot that large expanded clone in space. Those are the purple dots, and the grays are all the other T cells. And you can see there's a strong enrichment towards one particular uh, spatial localization. And um, so this T TCR actually has a strong preference for interacting with one tumor cell and uh, cell population. And it's actually driving the cytotoxic phenotype. And so we were a little bit curious about why why this is the case. Um, and there's maybe two two hypotheses. One is this like uh, kind of this HLA locus sound regulation in tumor one uh, due to this copy number loss in chromosome six. Um, and uh, we also performed some in gene set enrichment analysis on differentially expressed genes between the tumor populations and found that tumor one is downregulated in antigen presentation. So maybe it's like avoiding this, uh, this T cell clone by, by downregulating its ability to present antigens. Um, the second hypothesis is actually um, there might be some de differentiation. Um, uh, there's this co common um, phenomenon where uh, these, these melanocytes might, um, these melanocytic. Um, melanoma cells might lose their melanocytic identity and then lose the associated antigens, endogenous antigens. And so we, uh, to look into this, we actually performed spatial multiomic sequencing. Or we did joint attack and RNA-seq. And you can see that we can recapitulate the same cellular populations and as well as place them back into space. And using the multiome data, we can actually uh, score them for this mesenchymal-like transition. And you can see that tumor one, uh, which is uh, kind of the, the the population that the T cells avoid um, is uh, downregulated in PMEL and mLNA um, and upregulated in TNC and Excel. So it's like undergoing this like mesenchymal like state transition. And we can actually go and look in our TAC data uh, to see if we can identify transcription factor motifs associated with this mesenchymal like state. And here on the x axis, you can see. Uh, basically motifs that are associated with this transition versus associated with the melanocyte state. MITF is the master transcription vector for the um, melanocytic state. So that's that makes sense. And then you get these phosgene um, and IF9, uh, some of these like um, uh, TFs, which are positively correlated with the transition, which some have been previously uh, quite well characterized uh, for, for this uh, transition. And but on the y-axis here, you actually see the spatial clustering of these TF motifs. And for example, uh, a lot of these IRFs and and phosgenes are actually like spatially clustered locally, uh, suggesting uh, that there's some like local uh, signaling, perhaps, or local environmental pre pressures that are causing um, this sort of this sort of transition. Okay, okay so that's just a highlight of the data. So um, since you know, Cytax is kind of a generalized technology for like localizing single nuclei into uh, with high spatial resolution. So what's next? I think that basically like if there's no difference in the quality of the data and if we're already collecting a lot of single nuclei data, there's like no reason not to associate it with spatial context. So we're, we're working quite hard on scaling this across many tissues and uh, to basically every single cell experiment. And then we're working quite a lot on adapting other sort of genomic and epigenomic uh, measurements. Um, and then maybe for the community, I think there's there's quite a lot of interest maybe for perturbations in tissues as well as uh, large-scale AI models for understanding tissue organization. Thank you. Uh,
and I, I know I, I sped through that. So we, I wanted to give you guys some time and uh, for discussion. Thanks so much, Faye. Uh, we really appreciate uh, all of our speakers today. Please do join us on screen for a moderated discussion. Uh, I would like to introduce Musa Mwanga and uh, Mas Hanifa as our moderators. Both of them are the organizing committee, HCA organizing committee members, and I will let them introduce themselves and uh, we'll spend the next five, ten, ten minutes um, in discussion. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Musa Hanifa from the Wellcome Sanger Institute at Newcastle University. Hi, my name is Musa Malanga. I'm from the Radboud Institute in the Netherlands. So thanks very much to our speakers. A big round of applause. And it's been super inspiring and really, really amazing in terms of the breath. And I guess uh, there were quite a lot of questions. And I think the specific questions probably best to answer. But, I, you know, I was thinking about um, more of a discussion uh, and in many ways, we've seen, uh, you know, a panoply of methods, particularly in terms of spatial genomics and spatial omics. And there doesn't seem to be one method to rule them all. And I wondered what your thoughts were in terms of if you were to start, you know, and wanting to do spatial experiments, you know, where do you begin? And, and really, how do you know what's best for your uh, particular biological question? Um, I'm I'm happy for you know the actor Alan or I'm not I don't think Faye is here for you, for any one of you to answer the question. I, I guess from our point of view, we were very interested early on in and also thinking about the the complexity of multinucleated hepatocytes, and so we were trying to find an approach that would give us subcellular resolution. Um, and at the time, as we were thinking and looking through this, the the, the merfish and, and certainly the seek fish as well were the, really the ones we thought would give us that higher resolution. I know that a lot of other technologies are catching up now, which will make that easier to apply. Uh, but for us, we were we were really trying to get into you know thinking about even the subcellular localization, and there weren't as many approaches that were that we thought had that resolution early on. Um, so I. I'll just say, I think um, what you said is is really true, right? There are a lot of different approaches and there isn't just one to rule them all. Definitely not now, maybe maybe it will come up in the future. Um, but currently it really depends on, I think two things. One is what you wanna ask and the other one is what tools are available to you. Um, and so are you interested in the mRNA? Are you interested in the protein? Do you want to work on clinical samples? Can you work with frozen tissues? Can you work with FFPE tissues? Uh, do you care about doing, you know, one sample very, very rigorously, or do you want to do a cohort of dozens or hundreds of patients? So really depending on kind of your scientific motivation, different approaches now have their advantages and disadvantages. And hopefully, you know, all of them are kind of working on their disadvantages so that we'll get to the stage where all of them can do, you know, RNA and protein and multiomics for, you know, archival 30 year old FFP tissues. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And I guess I'll just kind of come and bring another perspective. And maybe this is also where Musa, I'm going to put you on the spot to sort of give your thoughts as well, despite being a moderator. Um, you know, one of the things that the Human Cell Atlas did very well with the kind of like suspension data sets was to sort of like be able to um, almost allow com comparisons across multiple sort of like um, projects and, and disease types and data sets, so to speak. Uh, and I guess, um, you know, I was wondering what you think the role of an organization uh, or initiative such as uh, the Human Cell Atlas is in terms of trying to kind of like, um, you know, make more progress into spatial genomics approaches, or, you know, omics approaches and, and kind of uh, trying to find, uh, you know, or, or benchmark methods, so to speak. Um, you know, your thoughts on this would be most welcome. Is that for me? Well, Musa <laughs> and Alan and Liat, I guess. Yeah. I, um, I think it's important to have standards and, and, and benchmarks. And, and as an organization, I think we could contribute tremendously to that. Um, I also think actually there are some existing data sets. And, and I guess my question I wanted to ask Liat, wonderful talk, is in terms of proteins and some of the tools you've developed, that are able to learn morphologies of proteins, to what extent could you use another data set 
like the human protein atlas to train your convolution neural network to be able to recognize shapes of proteins because i think that's contributing a lot to your compression approach yeah that's a really excellent question um this is exactly what we're trying to do now so we're kind of doing it in steps we started by learning you know when we have the compressed data and the ground truth uh, next, the next stage was to say, okay, you know, a lot of Codex, maybe IMC data sets have been published, which measure, let's say, around 50 proteins. Can we use those? Let's try and use those publicly available data sets where 50 proteins were measured individually and see whether we can compress them to five channels. And this is what I've shown today. Um, the next stage, and obviously the holy grail, would be to say, okay, now let's try and learn from a, a really amazing resource like the Human Protein Atlas, where we have different proteins stained individually, but they're stained in different tissue sections. Can we use that and learn from that? And that is a, a you know a notable challenge, and and we're thinking about that quite extensively. We don't have a solution yet. I mean, I think it's as I was answering Maz's question, and thanks so much for your answer. But I think it's really exciting that we can sort of benchmark and use other sort of orthogonal approaches to be able to, to solidify our, our novel observations. Um, I guess my uh, misfortune or fortune is that both of you, Alan and Liat, are using true imaging approaches. So, you know, your true RNA imaging and true protein imaging, that's a little bit different from, say, the other techniques that we saw that use inferred imaging approaches, if you want to call them that. So one thing I, I, I feel that needs to be benchmarked in that sense is to what extent do we transfer that information into the true imaging space? So what is our comparison, whether we're using some of the approaches like uh, C-splotch or some of the others that um, Faye presented, which are really beautiful methods, but how do they transfer into the true imaging space, right? Yeah. Murfish, like if you were to compare some of the regional and zonal data that you have, Alan, and this is really in the quest for benchmarking, and you compare the Murfish acquired versus, say, the SlideSeq acquired data, to what extent are they concordant? Yeah, I think that would be great to check. We're actually, Faye has run a couple of our samples um, for SlideSeq as well. Uh, the, we, we haven't tried merging that data to see, like to benchmark those, but it's something we certainly could try. Um, the resolution is still not quite the same. Um, and, you know, we, we we also have the limitation with a lot of these approaches because, you know, we could do with, with Murfish, we were doing, looking at 317 genes here. You know, we think with, if we're careful about not selecting genes that are too highly expressed, we can probably go to a thousand and still have the same resolution, but we still don't get the full transcriptome. Um, we've also tried merging that with the NukeSeq data from the same samples, uh, and it is to try to build up, in theory, more of a transcriptome for those individual cells. Those data are still hard to integrate. Um, they're, they, we get the same trends, but but it is really hard to match them one for one. Um, and then probably as we, you know, there are better ways of trying to do that, we may be able to do that better. But I didn't show, we have some merges where we've taken the NukeSeq data from the same samples and merged those with the the, the uh, murfish and the murfish also again gives us better spatial resolution than we get by estimating that based on just the transcript expression alone. Uh, Musa, we can't hear you. I think you're on mute. I apologize. Sorry, I said Maz, you've done Visium experiments, and to what extent have you been able to like cross compare to other techniques in your data sets? Yeah, I mean we've we've done Visium um, along with the single cell of the same tissue and also kind of uh, validating uh, using probe-based fish hybridization methods as well as protein. Uh, and generally RNA, you know, is very much comparable, uh, but there is always a slight difference. Sometimes some, some RNA and protein, you know, you, you get the, the very good um, agreement in terms of the expression, but there are times when it isn't. Um, but I think one of the difficulties that I kind of have experienced and also wanted to hear um, 
from our panelists uh, today is when you have a dense infiltration of cells, particularly immune cells, it becomes much, much harder, uh, even if you want to segment cells to really be able to sort of identify at single cell resolution, the true expression, be it transcript or, pro or protein. And so I guess, yeah, from, from you know, what you've described, that becomes another kind of mountain to climb in terms of, uh, you know, training and and using something like com, you know, com complex. So, you, you know, your thoughts on this would be very, very uh, illuminating, and 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 for the rest of the panel as well, because when you start getting a lot of cells infiltrating in, it becomes quite difficult to tease them apart, really. Yeah. So I'll say this is uh, obviously I'm I'm biased. I I love the protein based approaches because <laughs> they give you the single cell resolution. Um, so we can see individual cells, you know, I often see, you know, like a single T cell surrounded by macrophages, you can see them. Uh, analysis is definitely challenging in the sense that segmentation algorithms, although they've improved drastically, they're still not perfect. And I'll say that even if they will become perfect to the level where we'll say, okay, this is exactly how I would segment this cell, they would still not be perfect for this task of identifying different individual cells because, you know, cells in the tissue, they don't sit next to each other like that. They kind of sit like this, right? Mm -hmm. They're membranes, they have projections, they're interwoven. Um, and so, you know, taking the spatial data and realizing that spatial data is not single cell data. It's not. We're looking at sections of cells. They could yeah, be on exactly. top of each other. They could be merged with each other. They can be interacting and kind of dissecting that to single cell. I think it's still a very big challenge for the community, definitely in cases where you don't have single cell resolution, but also in technologies where you do have single cell resolution. And I know yeah. many people are working on it, us included. And I guess that's also true because you're only having sections and not having volume imaging. Um, and so, you know, any any sort of like uh, forecasts and ideas on how we get volume imaging and through genuine single cell with the interactions. I mean, that's kind of like the dream for everyone, I suppose. Yeah, so a couple, I mean, at least in the protein imaging uh, world, a couple of, of works have come out where they, they have done 3D. Yeah. Um, but, but all of them are currently, you know, like on a single yeah. piece of tumor, right? The big challenge yeah. is to kind of scale this up where this becomes really feasible. And then the second one is, you know, I think a lot in my lab, I didn't talk about it today, but we work a lot in clinical projects. So when you start thinking about the clinic, there becomes this issue of, you know, do we want to waste material for this 3D imaging? So how much does in this increased resolution help us versus, you know, taking, this limited amount of material to let's say other approaches. Um, and so this this kind of becomes yeah. a trade-off. Yeah. Alan, have you got any thoughts on that in terms of um, you know, the future of where things could go with regards to dissecting at single cell resolution, having more volume and you know, multimodal, multi-scale essentially? Yeah, I mean. I think it's still certainly challenging. The hepatocytes for us are easier because they're bigger, they're well-defined. And even if we do seven different slices, we can get a pretty good idea where they are. The immune cells you know, are more difficult. They're smaller. Their cytoplasms are smaller. Those are more challenging to define. And you know, think about hepatic stellate cells or endothelial cells. They have projections going in a lot of different places, and we know we're not where we would need to be to be able to, to identify those. I think, I know within some of the groups within the liver group are interested in doing some, or trying to do volume electron microscopy to get a better sense of that. Uh, the problem there is, you know, it's they're discovering how how many images and how long they have to acquire images to get the resolution they need to be able to really define those areas. Um, I, I think Murphish does give you, can give you, and some of the other platforms can give you some sense of spatial um, information. Uh, but but normally when we analyze these, they're still being collapsed into a single Z stack yeah. and, and we lose that that resolution. So I mean, I think you could do more stacks and and try to individualize the you know, analyze them separately and try to to get some of that. But we we still don't have great markers, especially for cells that are, you know, have large projections. We just don't have a good way of being able to to analyze those right now. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um I think we're coming to the end of the session and we'd like to thank all of our speakers for the fantastic uh, talks and also to everybody who's attended uh, online. And thank you very much, Alan and Bridget, for your help with organization and a round of applause for everyone. Thank you. And thank thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye. Thank you.